because there's nothing people hate more than a than a crappy dog yeah. that doesn't listen and doesn't oh, do yeah. what he's supposed to, especially in the hunting community where oh, he's yeah. ruining everyone's hunt. Hello and welcome to the Green Way Outdoors podcast. My name's Kyle Green. I'm AJ. I'm Kellen. I'm Ryan. Kellen, you fit right in. You didn't. You didn't it was have timed, to. Didn't blink an eye. Yeah, he timed didn't. very well. He was ready to go. I mean, and it doesn't smell in here. It's like I've done this. Before. <laughs> that, yeah, it doesn't. Jeff's not here. Jeff's not here today. So actually, we want to introduce Kellen. Kellen is our. Uh, I guess his title would be PR manager. So well, this is his second guest appearance. Second? Second. Yeah. second. At least second. Is it third? Second for sure. Okay. Yeah. Second in this huh. studio. In this studio, yeah. I didn't know if you were in the other studio. No, ever. no, no. No? No. Well, so. Kellen's kind of been working with us behind the scenes for years, and I've kind of teased in a couple podcast episodes that we have a big announcement coming up that I still can't tell you, and I actually don't even know when I'm allowed to, but eventually I'll be able to tell you what the big announcement is. There it's is something big. coming. Yeah. It's, it's the it's biggest. Big. Yeah. It is real. It's yeah. why I'm here. It's not, Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and because of that, uh, we were able to bring Kellen on board, and he's taken over all of the, the PR management stuff, and you've got kind of a cool background, too. Yeah, so a uh, handful of years doing... Uh, communications, um, internally communications, and then PR, and then also graphic design and video kind of work. So you kind of work perfectly for everything us. you want. Yeah, well, it was everything we need, and sometimes you can't always get what you want. No, nope. you, well, you can't. Whoopie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. It was very relevant for someone. It, you got it. You recycled it, and you spit it back out. I like it. You, you've done work with nonprofits as well right yeah so I've worked with the uh, rough grouse society quite a bit and did uh, social media there and when you're working with small groups like that you do a lot of different things you know you're assigned to social media but I did a lot of graphics and I did some help with some PR stuff and different initiatives like that so how did how did you get and how did that start like, uh, what, what just had a passion for rough grouse hunting and bird dogs and uh, they had a little bit of a transition of their um, leadership and when the new president came on board I I was a little bit of a greasy wheel and just kept saying, hey, man, I want to help. Hey, I want to do this. Uh, looks like your Instagram could use some help. Buff buffering. Buffering, yeah. So you're kind of like a contractor. I was, I was, well, I was on staff with them, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, just, just started, uh, they, they called me up one day and he's like, hey, you got 10 minutes for a phone interview? And I was like, well, I'm going to a doctor's appointment 11, so I have 10. And he's like, okay, cool. So I talked to him for 10 minutes and he's like, sweet, can you start today? And I was like, how's Monday? He's like, okay, Monday's fine. <laughs> so I just, I like instantly started working there. I worked there for a little over two years and yeah, <clears throat> yeah it was kind of fun. And they, they kind of had a whole reconfiguration of things, right? That, yeah, that yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how it happened when uh, when they brought God in the new us. president. Yeah, they yeah, yeah they just uh, they ended up hiring a communications director, and she's taken over kind of all that stuff. And so now I just um, working with you guys. Yeah, yeah. kind of condensed yeah. your Which role. Best thing to ever happen. You to know, us. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what I like about Kellen's story too is he kind of every one of us has come on board to the Green Me Outdoors in kind of the same way where we have like some sort of story where we worked really hard to get on and took initiative on our own. And realistically, what we do is like mm -hmm. we're so passionate about it and so difficult. And it's important to have drive, and there are so few of people that have it. There are so many people that have asked us, do you guys have paid internships? Yeah. Do you guys have <laughs> this? Do you guys me. have that? <laughs> and it's automatic like automatic transmission. This is that four-wheel drive. Sorry, Home oh, yeah. Alone quote. <laughs> that was a good Home Alone quote. Um <laughs> Jeez, uh, get get out of here! Yeah, um, I got you. Home Alone, the Christmas movie time. I get it. Um, <clears throat> you need to see the photo of me when I was a kid. I looked just like Macaulay Culkin as a kid. Did I'll you really? Yeah, I'll have to show you. I'll have to send you the video. I want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you do that? <laughs> I, I probably should have. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, you didn't go to crack in your older age. No, did you? no, no. Right. So far, so good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's yeah. cleaned up. It's yeah. okay now. <laughs> Is he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, he's he's he looks yeah. good now. He's with the. Uh, yeah, he's he's doing good. He always looks like the guy that owes someone money though, doesn't he? Yeah, Not, looks like, like it. But yeah, doesn't. Yeah. But that, <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> so anyhow, back to what I was saying. Sorry. The point with Kellen is he came on the same way that all of us have is that he showed up, to, what, three, four years ago and was like, hey, I'll do anything I can to help you guys. I like what you're doing. And then stayed in contact and truly did stuff for us in the background until we were able to bring someone on. And then it was an easy choice. And that's that's kind of how you get anything out of life because it's all this people are like uh, there's an old Zig Ziglar quote actually, where he says people want the campfire, but they want the fire and then they say they'll put the wood on it. Yeah. And that's not how it works. Yeah. In mm -hmm. order to get the fire, you got to put the wood on first. The it, you you were 
<coughs> consistent in the best way possible because other people are consistent and it just drives us nuts. Like, th- like we were kind of talking about it earlier. You know what you should do? You know what you got to do? Can I be on your show? Like just stuff like that where it's like Ugh. there's a lot of – you know what you guys ought to do? You got to have me on your show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's oh, just – okay. What a plan. Yeah. Um. But no, and and honestly, you had all the skills and stuff that we needed specifically to to take us to this next level with this big announcement that we will have soon. So I won't tease it anymore. Um, but the other reason why we wanted you is because you're a cool dog. Yes. So Kellen, you just got a new dog, and for those of you who don't know, Kellen's like an upland connoisseur. <laughs> no, is that <laughs> it? But <laughs> um, he's very experienced in upland hunting and raising dogs and training dogs, and you just got a new one. Yeah, I did. Um. I have gotten, I've had pointing dogs for quite a few years, and I made the jump into flushing dogs, which is a whole new world of craziness, literally craziness. And uh, I have an English cocker now. He is. I call him the coon dog. I named Rip. Yeah, yeah <laughs> his name is Rip, and he is awesome. He's probably just under 30 pounds, and he's just got a ton of energy. And he's Is he got that a, heavy? Yeah, he's probably like 30 pounds now. Yeah. He doesn't look dirty. Yeah, no. no, he doesn't look like it. I know. It's weird. Muscle. He's got short legs. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he's It's like cute. a coney dog. He's like a coney dog. AJ, put a picture up on the screen right now of me with Rip. Yeah. And uh, Rip running around. I got a couple of videos too, but he's he's cool. Yeah, he's cool. And it's and I'm telling you what, grouse hunting with a flushing dog is crazy. Grouse hunting with a little cocker is insane. And uh, had a really fun year with him this year. Got actually had him flush and killed the first grouse for him, and he retrieved it. It was it was awesome. It's kind of a kind of a funny story if you want me to tell it. Real yeah, quick. yeah. So we it was uh, the last day of grouse season before the split. So um, in Michigan, the last day of grouse season ends, and then deer hunting season opens for the rifle. And so we were out hunting. We'd been hunting all day, and I was like, I gotta get one killed for rip. I gotta get one killed for rip. And we're trying, we're trying, and. We come down to this spot. I had my dad and my buddy Dave with us, and we're out. And uh, I'm like, it's getting close to the end of the day, and I'm like grinding. I'm like, we got to keep going. Everybody, uh, kind of like the slave driver. I'm like, let's go, let's go. We got to get a bird yeah. for him, you know. And my dad's tired. My buddy Dave's like, oh man. So we get out to this. We get out to this. We're running the spot, and I kind of come off to the road a little bit because I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go next. And so my buddy Dave was standing to my right, and I was standing to the left. My dad was still in the cover, and again craziness of a flushing dog is that they're always working and they're going to flush a bird rather than point it. And I'm looking at my phone on my on X looking uh-huh. to see if I can see where I'm going to go next. And all of a sudden I hear the, the grouse flush. And I look to, I look to my right where my buddy Dave is and this grouse flushes <laughs> from behind him and goes in between us. He could have probably caught it. Like you've seen that video where, where the, the guy, guy catches yeah, the whale. Yeah. It could have been like that just happened so fast. And flies in between us and i see it get out to the road my dad's in the cover and shoots once and misses and i had my phone in my left hand and my gun in my right hand and i hip shot this grouse from across the road no with, my 20, with my 28 gauge and it goes down and i just started i just started losing my mind yeah. i'm like i got it i got it and uh my dad and every, we're all laughing and i'm like trying to get ripple i'm like we got to get the retrieve because i i was like it was a pretty good shot and pretty and far. Rip, rip did flush the bird he flushed it 100 percent flushed it yep it came right out of the cover, flushed it, and uh, so I run over there. It was in a whole bunch of hawthorns, like terrible picky stuff. So I like send him in. I see the grouse on the on the ground. Send him in for the retrieve, and he grabbed it. And I came back out, and we were just like, "What just happened? Like how it's like, surreal? It was crazy. Like just to kill that bird is crazy. But the way that I just like instinctively just like shot it from the hip, didn't even pull my gun up and got it. I was like, "That's amazing." And it was twenty eight gauge and twenty eight, <laughs> which we rip on, but yeah. I mean. I, like I was saying the other day, you guys are psychos <laughs> for using those things. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I shoot that gun better than I shoot any. I bought a brand new Beretta this year, uh, 20 gauge, and I did not shoot it well at all. And uh, man, that 1100 I shoot is just, I it fits me perfectly. And I think that's a big part of it is the that's fit. That's crazy. The yeah. Fit. Yeah. I know gun that fit. a lot of the Upland hunters, they do the custom stocks and stuff just to, it, could, it just changes a lot. Oh, uh, How did you get into it all? bird dogs i got a got a short hair i got a short hair and uh i got him quite a few years ago my buddy adam actually has his brother ace still and uh that's yeah it started with the dogs and then i started going from there what so but what what led you to the dogs like what what were you i well i i was a deer hunter uh my whole life my dad had me out deer hunting and uh, i would just go out with him all the time and when i went to college i kind of was like 
in a in a transition phase where I started playing quite a bit of golf and I kind of I wouldn't say I stopped hunting I just didn't hunt as much and then when I uh, when I ended up wanting to get a dog after I gra- graduated from college I got a short hair and that's where it started and my buddy Adam got a wasn't my buddy at the time he became my buddy and is now my one of my best hunting buddies he got a dog out of the same litter and I was like dude I have no idea what I'm doing teach me and we started going and learning and yeah no it's that's all awesome I, pretty much all i do that's cool <laughs> it's kind of a funny backstory too. his friend adam the one he's talking about it's kind of crazy but so our good friend scott slater he was in season one with us and he's been involved at least in some some way shape or form behind the scenes with the Grammy outdoors for the last six seven years and he's one of my best friends um he would like learn about hunting and stuff from forums and you know different stuff like that online from people and one of the people that he got advice from all the time was this adam guy and the funny thing is this guy gave me advice for years and scott's like no like he changed how i like if it wasn't for him i wouldn't know half the stuff i know like he really took me under his wing helped me so much and i had always been hearing the word the words adam wilson out of scott for years he'd be like my buddy adam wilson said this my buddy adam wilson said that and then Kellen started saying it, and I never connected. Like, what? No, no, no. I never connected it. I was always just like, oh, I know who that is. But I never connected two different people who were saying it to me. You right, know what I mean? right. And it, you said he did basically the same thing for you. Yeah. I mean, the the reason that I had a, any kind of knowledge of what a girl's even looked like was Adam and I went and I wanna, chased Woodcock. I want to talk to this guy. Well, yeah. this is the best example of someone, because we talk about this. The older guys, as far as hunting goes, they – they suck because if you don't know something, you're an idiot. You don't yep. know anything. You might as well not hunt. Not Whereas it sounds like going to a gun shop or a bow shop, and the people there talk down to you. Yeah, because you don't know everything. Don't have any questions. Very common. Uh, so this not guy, all of them, but very common. Clearly, he understands that. The, the, the spread the wealth of knowledge. One hundred percent, and I think it's a I think it's a really big thing in the bird dog community too. Is you don't know everything there's a million different ways to train a dog to do whatever it is that you want them to Mm do and a lot of people in that community are awesome about doing it to your point about mostly like deer hunters a lot of times it's like yeah you don't know that wow you're an idiot but the bird dog community is such a different community and i love and that's what i love about it i say archery and waterfowl are the toughest to get into yeah and they're the that tends to be the biggest paywall of jerks you know, yeah, it's like, dude. it's like, yeah, like you go to a bow shop and you're like, well, I was thinking I'd do this. I'm like, why would you do that? It's You just don't know anything. And, I, you know, a, as we've gotten into it, we've been doing it so long. I'm like, why don't you and I shoot against each other? And if I beat you, you're not allowed to say anything dumb again. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. you don't, you don't get to put me down if you can't beat me. Like, yeah. that's where you start to get to. It's like, yeah. fine, let's go duck hunting. See who gets more. And then, and then you don't get to put me down. You know what I mean? It like becomes that you get real increasingly frustrated. Yeah, but for someone new though, it's like I don't want to go in there and get belittled, or I don't want to go in there like if I, you know, you dry fire a bow or something. You don't even want to take it to the place because you, you just throw the ball away because you're not you can't face the people because of it. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> or, or or you get the people who just go out and do it and con- continuously make the same mistakes because they don't have anyone by their side helping. Can you imagine going grouse or woodcock hunting? And training a dog with no guidance. No, you would not have any luck. You lose your mind. Terrible, and you you would only do it a handful of times because it's if you don't know at least have an idea or have a have the ability to train your dog to get to a certain level, it's miserable. It's it's the thickest (laughs) cover. (laughs) It's normally hot or freezing, and you count. Gross, rough grouse hunting. It's hot or freezing. It and is. There's never an in the middle. It's no, never in the not. middle. It's, you get I don't know two how 50 degree days a day, and that's it. Yeah. And uh, y- grouse hunting is one of those things where you, you're like, I, how many, how was your hunt today? Well, I flushed 30 birds. How many kill? Well, none, but I flushed 30. Like, yeah. It's counted <laughs> in flushes. Cool, right? Yeah. It's counted in flushes, not It's kills. counted in number of failures. Yeah. 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 And so. that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would be frustrating otherwise. And, and to the points that I was making earlier about the bird dog community, I mean, having people that I've seen or, or met or the breeder that I've got ripped from just being able to ask questions like, Hey, I've trained a few pointing dogs, but this is new. Like, what do I do here? So being able to have those people to lean on, to ask questions like, Hey, what should I do? Like, where do I even begin? And like being able to get some just direction on where to even go, like just start with obedience. Okay. That's easy enough. We can do heel and sit and come and stay and then go from there. So it, it, that's the community that I think really should is is kind of leading the way and being welcoming to new people. And it's it's fun to be a part of. And it's something that 
I want to do more of and I try to do whenever somebody asks me questions, I'll take a second and respond back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't know, but ask this person or, oh, I do know I can help you or whatever. So I think it's a really cool community to be part of and and to like having had that done to me with Adam. uh, It's something that I try to do to anybody I can to to help because it's it's super infectious in my opinion. I like. So for people that don't know, talk about the difference between a pointing dog and a flushing dog. Yeah. Both of you. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, not to be a jerk at all, but literally a pointing dog will run bigger, larger. They go out and find the birds. You, you, you as the person driving the truck, you park the truck and you usually will put a GPS or a bell on your dog and you kind of have a general direction that you're going to go. You hope there's no porcupines. And, well, there usually are. But. <laughs> You'll find them. <laughs> yeah. they'll, they'll find especially them. If you got, especially if you got German dogs. <laughs> yeah. They love their porcupines. And, uh, yeah, they those, do. Those dogs typically will run a little bit larger, sometimes out of sight, depending on and When When Colin's saying that, he means like how far your dog is ranging from you in the sense that does my, rain, my dog range 10 yards or does my dog range two miles? Yes. Two miles is bad. Also, 10 is bad. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 100 is a pretty solid number, yeah. I like, for yep. a pointing dog. Like, 100 yards, if I see so you once wa- in a while. you're and walking, and that dog's always within 100 yards of you. Ish. And normally, you're hearing, beep. Either that beep. or a bell. Okay. And you're waiting for that dog to find that bird and go on point, and that's when you would. And go on point is basically the dog. There, he finds a bird in cover, or he at least thinks he did. His nose is telling him he did. Yep. He's going to come up to that cover where he thinks it is, and he's going to stare at it and point his little butt out, his tail, and then you're going to come up, and he's going to hold perfectly still so he doesn't scare the bird it, until you get there. In, in theory. theory. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking to people that have had dogs, so yeah. yes, that's how it should go. Right. It doesn't always, because those birds feel that pressure and can run so it's again to get into the whole situation of relocating on birds because that bird will run from one pine tree to another pine tree and if it ran too far your dog i have an older dog a setter that i allow to readjust because she can handle it and she doesn't bump birds right i have a pointer that hasn't figured it out yet and it takes a lot of grouse contacts to figure that a lot of bird contacts grouse aren't the only ones that do that so it's a it's a learning experience and when they're on point they'll hold like the, the eventually they get to a point like oh i'm supposed to i'll wait till you get here do that they get that but when you're walking up on the point if if their tail's flagging or if their head's real high it, it, they know it went away there's an indication that that, that bird's yeah. no longer there and eventually it gets to a point where you guys are th- there's a connection between the two and the, the dog s- looks at you he's like sucks right <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where you been where yeah. you been yeah. i've been standing here yeah, yeah. like you were here three minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> if you were here yesterday. Yep. And uh, so so realistically, it's the dog is going out and finding the birds within a piece of cover that you're putting them in. With a flushing dog, it's a little bit different. I think a flushing dog actually teaches you a little bit more about where the birds are because you have to – that dog – You kind of got to know. You kind of have to know because what that dog is doing is usually like 10 to maybe 35 yards-ish, somewhere in there. And – you're you're taking that dog to where you believe those birds are and then their their job is to find them and put them up for the gun so it it falls a lot more on the the, hunter. the guy driving the truck to put them in the right place say okay it's 3:30 in the afternoon i need to be going to um, a hawthorn uh, run or an alder run because that's where they're going to be right now and then it's that dog's job to work the birds find them and put them up for the gun so it's a little bit different i think it's it's cool because as you learn where grouse are and why they're there, and then you get a flushing dog, it really becomes that kind of game where you're like, okay, they should be in this location. And if they're not, that's kind of your fault. So question for you. Um, Because I'm, I'm interested in Rip now that yes, I met him. Yes, you are. I love that dog. <laughs> he, um, he's cool. He is so cool. I love his personality and how happy he is. Um, it was, you know, it just, and I, I've been looking at English Cocker videos everywhere. <laughs> and now every time I do... Like you see them put down the bird, like they brought it back, and they're hopping because they're like, "Look yeah. what I did!" Yeah, I mean, and I just their person, his personality is so amazing. So definitely not, definitely not talking for all flushing dogs because some of them labs are different, every, everything's different. But speaking specifically for English cockers, they have a very, very big urge to please. They want to, they want to be with you. They want to make you happy. So they typically don't run as big they're not going to run out to 50 yards and fly you know flushed not every single one i'm talking in kind of generals here but sure 
you know, he he wants to stay with you. He wants to hunt with you. He's he's found birds. He knows that if he finds birds, he's going to get a bird in the mouth. That's their reward is that bird in the mouth. He yeah. loves that retrieve. So when when he knows that if he finds a bird with me, there's a somewhat decent <laughs> chance that he's going to get a yeah, retrieve, yeah, yeah. you know. So that's kind of that Was thing. His, so you, you talked about the first round with him. Was there a couple misses where he's like, so nothing happens. I'm just out here just doing my thing and no one cares. And it's like, I don't matter. <laughs> and and, and well, that, still- that's the biggest fear initially with the dog is you, you bring them out a whole bunch. And if you're not performing, you're teaching your dog nothing. It's like, okay. Wh- so well, would you recommend out- a kick and shoot or a, a, a it- basically a, I call it kick and shoot. So yeah. uh, they have pheasant preserves. And for those of you who don't know, basically what happens is it's in Michigan, for instance, we don't have many pheasants, almost, you know, very few. There's a very short season on them. Good luck even seeing one if you take take advantage of the eight day season or whatever it is. <laughs> it's it's it, it's not a sustainable. There's not a robust pheasant population in order for you to partake in pheasant hunting in Michigan practically. So people pay money to go to these preserves, and the idea behind the preserves is they release a bunch of birds on these on these properties that's perfect for pheasants. Tons of food, tons of water, tons of resources. A lot of pheasants get away. And then hopefully we'll set up in the surrounding areas and hopefully bring the pheasant populations up. But also it's an opportunity for hunters to go out and hunt them. So it's kind of, it is not hunting in the sense of like, I have no idea if anything's out there. Let's hope for the best. Like when you go out there, you know that there's going to be 12 birds in that field that were put out today. Because you paid for them. Because you paid for them. And you have an opportunity to go out, find them and shoot them. And you don't know where they are. And it might be difficult. And you might only see four of them. But you know there's actually something there. Um, would you recommend doing something like that where number one pheasants are much easier to hit than grouse times a thousand and number three, number two, number three, that's one answer. You were on two. You hear me? Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> you're on two. that was good. Uh, a little Trump, uh, no there, but no, that that's one and two actually. Uh, cause it's that important. Uh, but would you recommend doing that as a, as a, like with a new dog in order to be able to make sure you're knocking down birds. So bird in the mouth is still the reward. Uh, potentially, I think the biggest thing with that is not just taking a brand new dog out there. You need a dog that has been properly introduced to the gun because that's a big problem. If not, no, I mean like so for the all, first hunting trip. for sure, for sure. I'm just, I'm just laying yeah. it out there for anybody that maybe doesn't understand. Yeah. I would not take Fu- your brand new dog out there and just start <laughs> ripping 12 gauge over it. No, no. Um, if you need help getting a dog gun broke, please reach out to somebody and get that done before you do any of this. That being said. Um, I don't think there's anything bad to it, especially for a flushing dog. It's a, it's a good time. I mean, they don't, that's the kind of cool thing about flushing dogs is they don't have to point a bird they don't, and it takes a long time for a pointing dog to figure out how to find point and pin a bird where these flushing dogs, they just, I mean, he's got a heck of a good nose. He goes out, wags his little nub of a tail until he finds them yeah. and flushes them. I mean, so, so, so it helps for sure. So a, um, so when talking about an English cocker, like rip. So Rip's going around. He is using his nose. Oh, so yeah. if you came up to – this is my question. is like let's say we're hunting a field and we find a place with a, a, a bunch of cover and it's real thick, Val. So it's like tough walking in and stuff like that. I can't really go in there, but Rip can. Absolutely. So you can be like, Rip, go work that. Yep. And he will? Or like what is – or is, yes. that, is so that the goal of a that's, – That's absolutely the get goal. Get in there he's and go not, do that. He's, he's not there – Currently, I'm working with him training this this year, and that's one of the big things about flushing dogs is just doing that obedience and teaching a back command or an over command for them to go and search back or over. And so, yeah, that's and that's perfect. And that's where we killed that first grouse was in this terribly thick hawthorn patch where, I mean, I walked in there for the retrieve and was like, oh, I couldn't even, like, <laughs> see. It was, like, terrible. <laughs> but he's so tiny to the ground. I mean, he just – He walks right through it. Right through it like it's nothing. So – yeah, definitely what we'll be doing this year with him is I'll be walking along the side of it, and he'll be in there, and he'll flush him out to me, like lobbing grenades at me, and I'll be ready to miss a whole bunch, I'm sure. I have another, <laughs> yeah, right. I have another question then. Um, so, man, I'm full of them, actually. That's good. The, the first question I want to go with is, so is there, like if I'm looking to get a dog, and someone's looking to get a dog, I'm like hearing a lot of pros and cons to both, but it seems to me like, it's easier to deal with a flushing dog than a pointing dog. It seems like there's less to learn. Is that right or wrong? Like, or what? And the other thing is, in, answer this inside that question, both of you, is also, 
are you more likely to not lose uh, birds to running? Because that's a, that's like the number one problem I've had with hunting over pointers. Not that it's the dog's fault, but you come up and like you said, it's not there anymore. Yeah. But if you're walking behind your flushing dog and it flushes, it flushed. Or do they? Will they run on the the the? the oh, they still run. But they what kind of advantage do they have now? You so know. Let me just preface because I know there's bird dog people out there that are nice and there's bird dog people that will hate on everything yeah. we say so i have pointing dogs i've had a lot of pointing dogs and i love hunting over a good pointing dog i now have a cocker i love hunting over the cocker <laughs> so yeah. um and i am certainly not an expert but i do love to do it i do quite a bit of it so anyways just throwing that preface out there yeah. anyway um the good thing about flushing dogs is you don't need as many solid bird contacts like put down bird contacts throughout your year leading up to your season because they love if if they're bred correctly and they love birds they're going to find them they're going to smell them out and they're going to find them they don't have to pin them they don't have to point them they just yeah. have to find them and flush them <clears throat> so they find the scent and they've pretty much done they, everything they've done it yep and they're going to find it because a lot i mean rip is bred really really well and that's what he's bred for is to find birds so basically all the stuff that I have to do with him is after I get him gun broken and conditioned to the collar, I'm doing obedience work that I can do in my house. I can do in my, the horse barn. I can do uh, in the driveway. I can do here in the greenway outdoors if I wanted to. Like yeah. we can do obedience training anywhere. With those pointing dogs, you really need to get those bird contacts. You need to be buying quail or pigeons and getting them out and putting them on birds and getting them steady and, and, and correcting any of their mistakes. The good thing about a flushing dog is – there's no real, the only real mistake they're going to make is if they flush a bird out of, out of range. I mean, other than that, and that's just, that just comes with experience and time. Right. They don't have to pin a bird. So right. it's, it's, that, it's, it's, it's a bit easier. That's so like what that's Ryan like, was saying about your friend, Isaac. He's out there every he, he weekend. He grinds. He's Hustling 38 on. age. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, yep. no, yeah. He grinds. But that's like what I was talking about with the dogs is. It, it, there's a lot of people who get dogs and they're like, well, it's going to be a hunting dog or it's going to be an upland dog. Well, it's not going to be an upland dog. Like, yes, you have a German short hair and it, it, it's obedient and it's mm -hmm. well-trained. However, that dog will not be successful under the conditions of going once a year. You have to go grind. Yeah. It, it just doesn't, it won't know what to do because there, there's a recovery time even into the new seat. Like season ends, you're jumping into the new season. There's a recovery time for that dog to be like, oh, yeah. We're getting back into it. I got like spring hit, training. I'm, I'm hitting my stride. I'm not pointing porcupines. <laughs> here's here's kind of the, <laughs> that's true. It's like every upland hunter I've ever seen too has a picture on Facebook of the, like them pulling quills out of their dog's face. Oh, I have it. it. Will I have happen. done it. I've done it with Rip, my setter. Rip hasn't yet. No, no, no. My setter. She opening day a couple years ago. I feel like Rip for sure will. Oh, <laughs> I saw him messing with the horses. Oh yeah. He'll do, <laughs> yeah. He'll. Oh yeah. He'll go after anything that moves for sure. Um, what I was gonna say is. Your length of time to get a dog ready, flushing to pointing, is so much shorter with a flushing dog. But you do have to do I, you have to do some more obedience on the back end. But I can do obedience training anywhere, right. anytime, anywhere. I can go downtown here and walk up and down the strip and and have obedience training with them. Yeah. yeah, you yeah you could do that with your pointing dog too. But they need those other bird contacts. So I think you're gonna. I think for somebody that's more of a weekend hunter or somebody that doesn't have the time to do all of that training, you can get into a, a flushing dog like a, co a good cocker, um, and and have a productive dog. Uh, like Rip was born in January, and I had a productive season this year with him. So I mean, like there wow. you go. You know, those pointing dogs that are younger that are born in January are gonna take time. I mean, they some of them are going to go out and just have it and naturally point fine birds. Some of them are going to take a little bit longer. I think that you, I think you're pretty safe to say that you're going to be able to have a productive dog quickly with a flushing dog, especially these cockers that are so, you know, willing to please. A, a big thing with dogs in general that people lack awareness of is um, you, from the day you get the dog, you need to create a, like a system like a like a social hierarchy where I, I'm clearly the boss, but we're working together. Mm -hmm. That's like I, the the Standing Stone Kennels. Yeah, the way they do it. Yeah. All their pups have to work for their meal. That's currency in this household. We do exercises before every single meal, and and with every exercise you get a little bit of that meal. At the end you get the big reward. Every single meal. And it creates a system where it's like, okay, we work for things here. There's a so process. Like, what There's are some an order. What are some examples of that? 
an example would be on a young pup trying to so they have cues as well so like a clicker so you use the clicker in coordination to mark, to mark the behavior to mark the behavior right so after they complete their task and it doesn't even start with words in the beginning it like the, it starts with the hand touch teaching them to come to you and, and and you're holding the treat in your hand well every time their nose touches your hand they've come to you and that's that's the mark and the cue is the click saying you've completed click means good click yeah. means good you've completed task it's and then like they get the treat and, and then the, and then they get the food and you just do that a few times you spend five ten minutes doing that and then you're done you don't want to turn it into like this sucks because you're going to get frustrated and they're going to be like i don't know dude i don't know what you want from me so it starts very simple and then they bite <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's like that's like my buddy isaac we were talking about the other day you're teaching your dog to sit your dog doesn't listen. So you walk over to the dog and you push its butt down. And and you've done this a few times now. You've now made the cue, me walking towards you, and the mark is, is me pushing your butt to the ground. The mark being, that's how we complete the task, is me pushing your butt. Yeah. And that's why your dog doesn't sit until you start walking towards it, because that's the cue. That's now the click in its head that, <clears throat> okay, my cue is you've walked towards me, now I sit. Now, now I sit. So what's the answer for that then? The answer is unleash. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't do it that way. Start unleash or or or, or, zap. or the same thing with with its with its just barbecue <laughs> <laughs> with its meal. Have your clicker and wait till that dog sits. R Mark reward. It. Mark it. And, and reward then you, it. And, you, and you do the click and the reward. Is Rip like an eater or is oh, he? Oh, he's super food motivated, which is also <laughs> cool because to Aren't what we all you know to, yeah oh yeah. To what Ryan was saying, that's how, I mean, I have not done it since hunting season started, but pre-hunting season, that was what I was working on with him was exactly that. He worked for every meal and we would go out and we would, he would, I had a little place, I have a little place board. He'd place, he'd sit, I'd mark it and give him his treat. I would make him sit there and I'd walk back 10 feet and call him to me. And when he came to me, I marked it and gave him his treat. And then I would go back 20 feet and make him sit halfway to me because I want to at some point I'm starting to start this remote whistle sit, which is what we'll get to this year of, of training. So just starting those little cues early. And a lot of it is on leash training with these dogs too, is just getting them used to being that pressure on leash because that translates to the collar, which is next. Trust is built in the day. It's built over time. The early hours and the late nights. It's built by doing the work and pushing the limits every day. Because the promises we make are the promises we were built to keep. The Greenway Outdoors is brought to you by Ram Trucks. Built to serve. Motor Trends Truck of the Year for the third year in a row. And by... Bass Pro Shop and Cabela's. Your adventure starts here. Tracker Boats. Fish the finest. And buy these other fine sponsors. That was another thing is, so you can eventually, once you get the flushing, excuse me, dog where it's supposed to be, you would have him go into the brush. You'd be able to point that out. Ideally, he's going to stay about 20 to 30 yards away from you when you're walking. And the goal is you're walking in a direction of what you want to do. And I'll, I'll never forget this, too. Two parts to this. Part number one you mentioned, I could see why if the dog was getting away from you and he was super birdy, meaning, for those of you who don't know, dogs seem different when they're about to flush or when they're about to point a bird. When they smell the, a bird. I don't know how to describe it except for, you know, it's it's like... Uh, it's like uh, the bad stuff. You know it when you see it. Yeah. You know? Uh, they, they, I can I can give a super quick. They'll tar Tails will usually wag faster. They will flick their tail in sometimes, or their ears will twitch in some ways. Every dog has a little bit different of a tell, but they do something that you can tell they've peaked. It's peaked their interest. And you know it when you see it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know it when you see it. The pace picks up a little. You, you it, also know when the dog's doing nothing. It turns into more, like with, with the pointers, it turns more into this jumping frolic. And it's yeah. like, come on. Get, we're get, hunting here. Yeah. Yeah, get your head down. Yeah, it's like, get back in there. Hunt them yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, hunt them <laughs> up. Yeah, this is like every <laughs> sentence you've heard every time you go upland hunting. Yeah. Um, so that's ideal. So one of the things that you had talked about is if you can whistle stop them. So essentially yeah. what that is, correct me if I'm wrong, is 
your flushing dog has gotten 52 yards away from you, and he's birdie. You're like, hold on a second. I can't make a 62-yard shot by the time the bird's off the ground. Yep. So I need you to chill for a second. Let me catch up. If I whistle, he stops and sits. You get close to him, and then you say, okay, Rip, go get him. And then he flushes him so that you, it's a more controlled flush as opposed to the chaos of flushing something 70 yards from you. Absolutely. It's a yep remote whistle sit. So the idea is, and this is what I'm going to be working hard on with him this year, is remote whistle sits, and it starts on, on leash giving that sit he knows what sit is i give the i give the pull of the leash on him and i whistle and he knows that that means sit and then we take it off leash and go further but yeah the idea is that you blow a hard whistle sit if he gets a little out of range even if he's birdie and that's the hard part is getting them to there's a bird right there no no no, 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 no. i can i can't we came all the way here no, no yeah, yeah i know yeah. i know but i gotta catch up i'm slow <laughs> yeah so you the idea is yep you blast that hard whistle sit he sits down you quickly catch up and then release him and then that bird will keep keep on them and you, you you catch up to the bird so that that's that's one thing i want to yep. talk about the next thing i want to talk about was uh, uh the retrieve part so yep. these english cockers are great at retrieving now i've hunted over ryan's family's dogs before and they're fantastic about bringing the bird back uh and they're pointers so are it, him being a ret- uh you know a t- retrieving dog is he pretty good at bringing it back as well he loves it he those dogs just have a natural natural ability to retrieve it seems and he loves i mean he carries everything around i mean he runs out to the horse farm and he's got to find frozen horse poop to carry around because he's got to carry something around <laughs> don't we all <laughs> so course. it's just it's just a natural thing for them they love to do it he paraded that grouse around forever and i have things to work on with that as well but that's yeah, yeah but just having that there is one of the biggest things and we can work through it all so yeah is there like a possessiveness i've never had this because i've never had my own dog but i would assume or at least hope for this might be a very hallmark movie of me but is there like a is there like a real special thing going on between the two of you where like he can't communicate through english but when he brought that dog back that bird back you're like see this is great right yeah like you're both like this is special yeah i have the video and i'll have to show you but he was so proud of that bird he had it in his mouth and he was just prancing kind of like how you're saying when they get birdie and they have that little wag and you know it if you see it he had this little kick to his step and he was just so pumped to have that bird in his mouth and he was just his head was high and he was prancing and he was so happy and it was just like we he just knew he he got it like that's it it clicked i i will there's Having both, there's something different about losing your hunting dog. Not to get all Marley and me, but it, <laughs> <laughs> but it it hits different. Yeah, like because you my, like built my, something together. Oh, big time! Like my when we lost Lil, my, both of them, especially Lil. And my for those was, of you who don't know, Ryan had Java and Lil. And uh, they lived to be ten or eleven years old. Uh, I think they were a little. They were probably around twelve ish. Okay. Um, and they died about a year ago. Uh, Java a year ago, and Lil a year prior. Um, and they were litter mates actually, fr- brother and sister. Um, but yeah, that that one tore my dad up pretty good. And he he grew up on a farm. There's not much emotion that comes out of losing an animal, but it 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 just you you work it's, so hard you and you spend so many hours with this animal, and there's like a bond where like. There, there's like this uh, communication you have just through body language with each other that's unlike anything else. I can tell you from the dogs that I've had, I've towed the line on life, relationships, work, uh, personal life, doing things with my bird dog. I've uh, and it's it's that time that you're out there and you maybe should be home or maybe should be doing this or maybe should be doing that, but you're out there doing it anyway, and it's. It's a passion that drives you, and if you have it in you, yeah, it, it'll beat you up pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, but it, it it's one of the more fulfilling things. One like like you were saying, getting that first bird, like seeing your dog, this you you you're raising it, it, they can turn into shitheads quick. <laughs> yeah, they are. Like, and there's <laughs> nothing, pe- and it, it you owe it to them to not let them. Because there's nothing people hate more than a than a crappy dog yeah. that doesn't listen and doesn't oh, do yeah. what he's supposed to, especially in the hunting community where oh, he's yeah. ruining everyone's hunt. Yeah, we don't. And play that game. and then no one likes him, and that's not fair to him. No. So you're hurting him no. by not teaching him because you're always mad at it. And, and but that's why it starts from a very very young age that like th- there's there's boundaries and yeah, yeah. It, what you're doing now. Uh, people lose this one a lot. Well, it's cute because it's a puppy, 
well, in two months when it's bigger, that's not cute anymore, and you're going to be upset, and he's going to be confused. Like, why are you mad now? You're, it was cool. Always, this was cool always, last week, but this. now you don't yeah, like it. I love this. Yeah. yeah. It's so, one little dookie on your pillow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's more like an, a simple example of which being like front paws up on the couch. Well, you're not allowed on the couch, but you're allowing my front paws on the couch. Give them well, that's inch. cute. That's cute when they're six months old and they're jumping up and doing that. I love you. I love you. And, but when they're full grown and, and they they jump on you with their front paws, you're like, dude, come get off of me. And it's because you allowed it as a puppy a few times and it set the rules. We can do it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. my setter is the master of if you give her an inch, she'll take a ten miles and just is, yeah, they'll like, run with it hard. Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> all right, all right. You can come on the couch. And next thing you know, she's got every pillow knocked off. She's rubbing on it like it's, this is my couch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, whoa. Yeah, she. Yeah, they do it. They do it. So back to coon dog named Rip. Even though he's not a coon dog, that's <laughs> from a episode of the Twilight Zone. Really? Uh, and there was a there was a dog in there, and his name and they always said coon dog a named Rip. And he was named Rip, so every time I see Rip, that's Hell why yeah. I, that's why I think of. I'll send it to you. Um, <laughs> it's a good one. It's about coon hunting. The dad dies, but he doesn't know he's dead. It's a whole thing. Dog dies too. He man. went in after a coon into the river. It's a whole oh, thing. Man. It's a lot in a thirty minute special. But the guy was willing to die to save it. Oh, that's, and he did. Yeah. Okay. So that tells you everything you need to know yeah. about your hunting dog. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's the connection you have. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, um, speaking of water, so he's an English cocker. Yep. Which means that he should be a good retriever. Which I so I after seeing Rip one time was like this is I need this <laughs> yeah yeah um and I started going online and looking and I wasn't seeing upland pictures yeah I was oh. seeing waterfall pictures absolutely so I got a few questions yep but the funniest of questions to open with <laughs> is I love Rip and I believe in him with all my heart and soul but in a street fight between a half dead goose versus Rip in water that's a pretty fair knock. Yeah, that that's a, a goose probably not his thing. Well, may not. Well, I I'd try it. I'd I'd let it. I'd let it, I'd give it a shot and see what happens because he's pretty scrappy. Yeah, you're you're definitely the dad that says if they hit you first, you can hit him back. <laughs> you got it. Well, I, I wonder if I, I I would almost have a concern with that in the sense though that if as an upland hunter you're going goose hunting now, and risking that a lot of these birds may be alive. Yeah. you're now creating a heavy mouth. Could be. Could what be. does that mean? What does that mean? That means you get hard a dog chomp. that hard bites chomp. really hard because if say it goes and gets a duck or a goose that's still alive and it's fighting them, they're they're clenching down on that hard. You don't want them doing that to your the dead good grouse. Thing, the good thing about him so far is that well, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Hard mouth versus soft hard mouth. mouth. Yeah, that's why. How do you how do you train soft mouth? No squeaky toys as a, a eventually a, a pup. you get, eventually get to a point where you you would do a trained retrieve for force break them. It feels like but, it feels like it feels like too. You really gotta watch who else is around your dog, potential. giving them lessons. Yeah, people watching your dogs need to know. I got him the squeaky toy. Well, I'm gonna kill you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. I have seen videos of these little cockers. I'll have to show you this this guy that I know on know from the cocker community of his dog retrieving uh, geese. And I mean, these dogs. You you saw him. You guys know he's got a heart as big as his body to do anything <laughs> he wants. And he does. Hit, and so the the situation you set up is a risky one, water alive. Ugh. But on ground, I would put Rip on it a hundred percent. Yeah, he, he'll he'll he'll. The he'll biggest factor is water for water. sure. Yeah, that that's a little. Our buddy Jeremy and he had uh, this dog that had like fused ribs or something like that. Anyhow, she's missing vertebrae. Yeah, yeah. so this dog's like oh. tiny. It's like a dwarf. Yeah. Uh, it's like a dwarf lab, right? And yeah, super well trained. Like I don't know that I've seen better. Um, very sweet, very cute, very whatever. We had gone on like three trips with this dog, and me and AJ were always like, I wonder what's wrong, but we never say anything. And it was so funny. Ryan goes the first time, he goes, what's wrong with that dog? <laughs> <laughs> and like we were so dancing around, and he's like, something's wrong with it. You know what, though? Sometimes it's funny because <laughs> sometimes sometimes that just that being that person that's had dogs or has dogs, you can kind of just get away with it because you're like, hey, what's up with that dog? Or yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. I've, I've had situations like that. So but I, I don't know. I will it's tell you funny. what, even with her being small, she was a uh, – behemoth in the water and on the yeah. land incredible yeah. dog well yeah and i'll tell you we took her snow geese hunting she had to retrieve like 92 in oh, three days yeah and she was a she just let it rip. well there was one that was running you know and half flying and she didn't see it jeremy looks at her and points to it 400 yards away and she just sets off in that direction because yep. he pointed that way yep oh yeah 
they are not Labradors. Let's just say that they are not going to be good in the super duper cold. They're I would definitely take them in the water and duck duck on them, no problem. The geese maybe. Um, what would your temperature range be? I don't know. I, it's hard for me to say because I've only I've only had them this year and I haven't done a bunch. But I did get a little vest for them, a little uh, neoprene vest it's, for them. It's them. cute. So yeah, so he looks awesome in it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, so I mean, we'll see. Imagine sitting out there with a light jacket on. I you, think you'd be upset. Like it, <laughs> it, it, they need they need a little something, especially the short hairs. I think yeah. I think once they get once he gets trained, and I have a little uh little sidekick form i can throw them in there keep them a little bit warmer probably be able to do a little bit colder but so what what would you recommend as far as like like him right now like what are you comfortable with 50 degrees 40 degrees oh i mean i i'll go out there right now if it's short i mean you know if i get one retrieve out of them then i'd be good in this cold weather but yeah yeah, yeah we'll see i'm gonna get i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to go on the uh duck split here what, what's what the what's the grooming because uh, I have an American in Cocker. Oh yeah, and I groom him. So yeah, I would assume he's been on the podcast. His name's Enyo. Oh yeah, <laughs> I would assume that. Uh, I just field cut him. I just okay buzz him up. Nice. And I did it. My my fiance did it uh, at the beginning of the year. Does he shed? Yeah, he's got a little bit. Not not terrible, but they're they're smaller. But yeah, just a little bit. A little bit. I wish the if he, you keep them trimmed up, keeps the problem. Yeah, reduced because you don't see the hairs. Yeah, so the crazy thing about the German short hairs, oh it, my you gosh. can you, they're the worst. They turn into slivers. They yeah. hurt. I've got them under my nail. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Really? yeah. Under my nail, poke me. They get into, hurt. Like yeah. if the hairs get in your socks, they'll like embed themselves into your foot, yeah. and you like pull out a hair out of your foot. Jeez. It's crazy. Car seat is just just got tons of these teeny tiny ones that you can't get out. Yeah. Yep. People worry about the long ones. The long ones suck, but the like the pointers or the short yeah. hairs, oh. The worst. Yeah, they're like little. They're little sharp Needles. slivers. It's yeah. crazy. Um, it, any? Have you given any more thought to maybe a time frame? Oh, that's a question I have. Nice. When's the best time of year to get a pup? I like getting mine earlier in the year, January through March, because especially with these cockers, they're gonna be ready to go by September, October. Uh, pointing dogs, similar. I like to get them earlier in the year. Um, I think. Overall, whatever's the best timing for you in your situation when you're ready is better than yeah. not being prepared. But if I had to pick my time on the calendar, it'd be January, February, March. <laughs> right. So that okay. I can have it, I can work with it. That's cool. You're 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 coming into a time where the weather's breaking a little bit. You're not gonna be dealing with as much cold, as much rain. You know, you're you're kinda getting into the summer where you're a little bit drier, so your dog's in and out of assuming dogs in and out of the house little bit easier you can do a little bit more training you're more apt to go outside and do training with it right yeah and that, the timing the timing leads right into hunting season where you you have a good opportunity that dog's old enough to have been gun broke by the time some fall comes around even if it's right before fall mm -hmm. um to where you can you can take them out i mean you you may or may not have a super productive season but you can still get them out the dog's gun broke you can get them on birds and if they do something great if they point it or if they flush it you can shoot it. So th the gun breaking thing brings up a good point that I've kind of, I have a hypothesis on that if you're looking for a kennel slash breeder, you almost want a combination of kennel slash pheasant farm because those pups are always raised around the shooting. And that my oh. buddy Isaac got one from Rooster Ranch and they're shooting birds. Dad went? <laughs> they're shooting birds 50 yards away from them. So those pups always heard shooting. And as long as you keep guns around them, they're they they they're not going to revert back to getting scared of of guns. They've yeah. always just known it. That's an interesting point. Otherwise, how would you gun break a dog? Um, I actually gun broke Rip with a frisbee this year. So I got him chasing a frisbee, and I did and that. You shoot at him? No, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no, I just got him. He he. That was the toy that he loved. I tried ball. He liked ball, okay, but he was infatuated by the Frisbee and chasing a Frisbee. So I was throwing the Frisbee for him a bunch, and he got super excited about it, and that's what I started using. And I, I did that to not cause – if there were any – if there were going to be any issues, it wouldn't be around birds. So he's not sniffing a bird and associating a terrible gunshot, you know. So you threw the Frisbee, and he's like so, running after it, and you start firing off rounds. So too. sort of. <laughs> so frisbee i throw the frisbee i have a 22 blank and while he's chasing the frisbee i would shoot one off behind my back while he's out there with no reaction i can then do it again no reaction again then i can throw it and shoot it faster throw it and shoot it faster no reaction i can get my 28 gauge out 
throw it and shoot it. And then by the time you're into a shotgun, you're pretty good. And then uh, get him. Then once Did he's he done that. Did he react the first time? Nope. No. Nope. He was all, he was good. Yep. He never reacted. Never reacted. It's a pretty sensitive subject, too, because, man, very... it would suck to get that dog that's, yep. like, first round goes off, and they're like, it's they shut down. It's uh, you, you get gotta, the gun out, and he runs downstairs. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you really need to build drive and get that drive, get them excited about a Frisbee. And then, and then I got them excited about quail. That's the next thing that I went to. So after I had done all that, I got him excited about a quail. And when uh, he, I put a quail for him, and he'd go out and find it. And it's harder with a flushing dog because a lot of times they'll just grab them because those pen race quail don't fly very well. Yeah. So I would have a spare one with me, and I would let him smell it or whatever, and then I'd release it for him. He'd go chase it, and I'd shoot. And then I, and then eventually I got to the point where I would just shoot him for him, and he would get that retrieving. I mean, it, yeah, it works out great. So it's a, it's a build that drive up and just take your time, take your time. And if you don't know what you're doing, find somebody that can help you because it's how you can easily, easily, quickly break a dog, That's, <laughs> not in a good way. AJ and I were kind of talking about it the other day that, well, Isaac was the one who was saying it to me, that there's more than one way to bake a cake. Yep, but, absolutely. But don't switch your recipes up halfway through Yeah. because a lot of like, if you're reading a book and it, it, it it's a, a start to finish from, from pup to adulthood, what you should be doing. You don't want to start switching up that training halfway through and change your techniques because there's, there's a method to the madness that this step leads to the next step. And then exactly. that step they leads to the up. next step. Yep. But it, in step three of six, you switch to someone else's techniques. The dog's going to be like, huh? Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't translate well. So reading books is a big one. B having a, a, a range of an idea of how, the direction you want to go in and what you expect out of your dog and, and sticking to a plan. If, if you're okay with your dog flushing grouse because they run, all right, then that's what you like. I, it, the, some people are willing to teach you, but they're like, the dog has to perform a certain way and it's very specific but to keep you interested in the sport you have to have your expectations ready of what you expect out of your dog and here's the other thing i think this may or may not be an unpopular opinion but my opinion is if you go to somewhere where you're going to get a dog from and you say hey i could use some help gun breaking this dog and your breeder looks at you sideways or doesn't offer to help or doesn't want to help I would pack up and run. You should be able to go back to a breeder and have them help you. Maybe they actually tell you, like my, like where I got ripped from. I go down there and train with them often. Yep, bring them on. We got pigeons down here. No problem. We'll get them gun broke. No problem. I, I didn't do it, but I have that option. If you don't have somebody offering to help you with that pup that they bred, bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Really? Yeah. yeah. Bye -bye. Well, I would say it's not like a money making thing, right? It's a passion driven thing. Yeah. I mean, what do they make off? How much does the dog cost? They're expensive. They can be. What's what's expensive? Like what's rip cost? Twenty five hundred. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. asked. Yeah. 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 Sure did. <laughs> a lot of those are. I mean, that's a dog coming out of the UK. That both his parents were imported here from the UK, um, and he's bred very very well to be what he is, um, but. You can get into pointing dogs quite a bit cheaper than that. I would say a thousand yeah. or less. But even yeah. so, like let's say, what do they raise? If they raise fifteen dogs a year, that's not an income. No, no, that's like a passive side income. But it certainly ain't going to pay for no, you know, kibbles and bits. That, that's probably the scariest part of the whole dog thing is you don't know what you're getting into as far as a breeder if you're looking for a performance animal because yep. these animals need to develop. It, the, the, the interbreeding problem is huge from the puppy mills, and it's easy to get a d dog from someone who's not doing it right or isn't mixing lineage as well, and that that's that's a big deal. Y you don't want something that's unknowingly a second cousin coming back and breeding into the f same family. Right. Yeah, I've seen that. There's a percentage that you can stick to, and you don't want to get too, <laughs> too crazy yeah. with that, or yeah. you, you might end up with a five-leg like, dog. It's like <laughs> you, even so, like you get the third cousin, and people start asking questions. Yeah. You know, trust me. <laughs> 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 On that note, I'd like to thank you so much, Kellen, for coming into the Greenway Outdoors podcast and joining the team and kind of getting to know our audience a little bit, or at least rather them getting to know you. Uh, but it's your job to create that audience, so yeah. I guess you'll own them soon. 
Uh, but <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. hey, I just want to say thanks. Uh, thanks for everybody listening, for listening to the show, and keep tuning in. We have a lot of really awesome stuff coming up. Super pumped to be part of the team, Kyle. Thank you for bringing me on. Uh, it's been a, it's been a time coming, but I'm super pumped to be here and be part of the team. And we got some cool stuff coming. For we're, cool. we're glad you are. And that big announcement, it, it is coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> when, when, when Kellen tells me how I'm allowed to do it, we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much for tuning in the Green Outdoors podcast. Um, if you want, go check out our main TV show. We do have some episodes on our YouTube channel right now. They're also on Carbon TV. But if you go to our website, which has been newly remodeled and pretty cool, the Green Outdoors, and you click How to Watch. There'll be a list of all the different platforms that the main TV show is on right now. Hint, hint, that will change soon. Uh, but go there, check that out, and check out some of our main episodes. Also, we have our HuntCast series, which is our more along for the ride. Some of our audience wasn't digging the long-form content with tons of conservation information, tons of voiceovers, big stories, that sort of thing that our main show offers. They like to just show me the YouTube version of yeah. <laughs> going along for the ride for yep. the hunt with some awesome artistic editing done by Ryan on that. But... If you go check out our HuntCast series, we've got a brand new episode up right now on our website as well on the homepage, but you can see all the episodes there too. We have our how-to video series. If you're wondering what's the best way to tie a fishing knot, how's the, how do I clean this gun, how do I, how do I pattern a gun for shooting clays, those types of videos can all be found on our website as well. It's an Th actual library now. Yeah, yeah. AJ made it pretty. Nice job. Um, and then our recipes are up there from the episodes. Yep. And AJ sorted them nice where it's like land, sea, and air. Yep. So if you like got a bird recipe you're looking for, boom. I highly recommend the duck epi uh, the duck recipe that's in there right now. If you go to the That's a good one. Yeah. That one's for air. It's 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 obvious because you can get watery on that one too, but yeah. it's it's in the air one and it's very, very good. <laughs> And then also, Watery. we will be having new podcasts every single week um, starting now uh, going forward. So um, I'm excited. We're almost to number 100, guys. I know. I'm just kidding. we got to do something special. Yeah. Maybe some balloons, <laughs> cakes, ice cream cake. I like ice cream cake. Uh. Thanks so much for tuning in. Stay green.